Good evening. Would y'all stand with us? Let's lift our praise to the Lord together. Put your hands together if you would. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind away? It was my turn till I met. Jason, the campus pastor here at the Cypress Campus, Houston's First Baptist Church, and we're so glad that you're here tonight, this incredible night with Hosanna Wong. So you're going to be encouraged, we're going to have incredible worship, um, you're going to leave uh, feeling, uh, again, just in the presence of brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, in the presence of the Holy Spirit and the, and the Lord himself. So thanks for being here tonight. Um, if you'll bow your head, let's pray, and we'll continue worshiping God. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. Thank you for the hope and the future we just sang about, Lord. And today is the future from yesterday, and tomorrow is the future from today. And we have hope for tomorrow because you're so faithful today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here tonight, God. Each one of us here today, I, breathe, I believe, Lord, that you brought us here. You have a word for us, Lord. You want to speak to us. 
So Lord, I pray that you would use worship, you would be honored and blessed through that, God. I pray for Hosanna as she shares tonight her gift, Lord, her wisdom, God, the word. I pray, God, that you would speak through her. And Lord, you would reveal new things to us, new things about your love for us, your plan, God, your goodness and your holiness. We love you, God. Holy Spirit, we want you here. We want you to move in our lives in this place. In Christ's name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Welcome. So glad you're here. Amen. Isn't Jesus good? He's so good. We're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time with him. And you're going to hear incredible word through Hosanna. And um, I'm just excited what God is going to do tonight because these kind of nights where we come with great expectation and great faith in the room, um, our eyes can really see and our ears can hear all that God wants to pour into our hearts. Amen. So the trajectory of lives can change for eternity tonight, not just in your life, but in your friend's life, in your family's life as Jesus flows through you. So I'm just going to ask you tonight as we start, just as we focus, you probably had a crazy day. I know the, the teams have been gathering from all over the city. We've been rushing to get here. So just take a deep breath, maybe close your eyes. If you feel comfortable, just lift in your hands just like this as we surrender this night to the Lord. And we're going to use an old song that hopefully you can, you can sing without even having to look at the screens. Just saying, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart because I want to see you tonight. Can we pray that together as it says a song? Sing it with me. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Why? I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. Only you, Jesus. And open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that verse one more time. Open. Open the eyes of my heart. Lift it up.
fear that took your breath away He's so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the
Everything bows at his name. Everything bows at his name. Sickness, darkness, chains break at the name of Jesus. Sing it with me. Everything bows at his name, yes, Jesus. Everything bows at his name. Sickness, darkness, chains break at the name of Jesus. Jesus, everything bows at his name. Everything bows at his name. Sickness, darkness. for your presence in this place. Would your presence be thick in here, Lord? In your presence, there's fullness of joy. There's truth. God, we just ask for your presence to be so near and so evident. God, would you soften our hearts? Would you soften our hearts to you, to your truth? We love you. We love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. We're going to continue in worship, um, but we wanted to uh, do something a little different in between worship tonight. Um, I know a lot of us come have come tonight with different stories, with different backgrounds. Some of us are carrying things nobody else even knows that we're carrying. Some of us are fighting battles that nobody knows that we're fighting. And before we continue into worship, we just wanted to create space for you to come as you are. Um, to encounter Jesus for real tonight. I want to share with you a story about where I'm from. I grew up on the streets of San Francisco. My dad battled a heroin addiction for 15 years and fought in a gang. And someone introduced him to Jesus, and Jesus changed his whole life. And um, my dad ended up starting an outreach to our friends living without homes and battling with addiction on the streets of San Francisco. And that's how I grew up. We had outdoor services two to three days a week. People brought their alcohol bottles. People brought their needles. That's how I learned church, by the way. I learned later in life when other people said they were also raised in church. We were not talking about the exact same thing. But that's where I learned that Jesus could save anyone's soul and redeem anyone's story. And it's also where I learned the art of spoken word poetry, which I'm going to share with you a story 
uh, right now through this art form. It's actually a language that all my friends on the street spoke. Everyone did spoken word poetry. It wasn't different, it wasn't unique. It was the way all of my friends shared their stories, just our stories memorized, and it became the way I could share about Jesus with my friends. If you have um, maybe can relate to when you need time to process things, things you've been through, things you feel, this was kind of the way we processed and shared our stories was through this art form called spoken word poetry. So I'm very, very blessed um, to be invited by your pastors, by Pastor Greg, by Pastor Jason, by this beautiful church here at Houston's First Baptist Cypress to get to share my story through this art form I learned on the streets. And I wanna share this story with you about a place I'm from. Now, you are going to see video footage of the district I was raised in behind me as I perform this piece. I want you to know that this past year, some of my friends just sent a film crew to my hometown to capture this footage for us. Um, so I had nothing to do with it. It was gifted to me, and I get to share with you a little bit about my story, but more than anything, the story of Jesus, the story of someone who can redeem and reclaim and restore all of us. So thank you for allowing me to share this spoken word piece with you. This is about the district I was raised in, and this is called Bernal Heights. I used to hate this place. The memories these streets hold for me make me sick. I used to hate this place. All it has meant to me, I wish that it could all be erased. I used to hate this place. The echoes of its pain bounce off its buildings, and for as long as I can remember, it has been this way. There is a district in San Francisco called Bernal Heights, and I, I used to hate this place. My dad grew up on these streets. Daddy got high on these streets, ran with gangs, had bullet holes banged into his calves from running from the police. Alongside his friends, his fellow thieves. My dad used to run these streets with the cocaine he used to sell, with the heroin he would inject, with the women he would beat on and sleep with. My dad was known on these streets. And as I grew up, I heard stories of who my dad used to be. Eventually, my dad turned his whole life around, found Jesus Christ, surrendered his life. But because of whom he once was and the dirty needles that once stabbed his blood, he was plagued with hepatitis C. And every time someone would tell the story of why my dad was sick my whole life, why some men hated him, why some women feared him, in the middle of every story was a place called Bernal Heights. I have always hated this place, for it was here at this place that in junior high, my best friend and I would take turns trying to help each other learn how to throw up our meals. We would compete with one another to see who could be thinner than the other. Here is where we would get together and talk of the things that we could do better to be more loved in the world's eyes. I have always hated this place, for it was here at this place that I would come to in high school at the bottom of Bernal Heights Hill with my boyfriend. And even when I repeatedly said, no, no, don't, please stop, still he persisted. And sometimes since I loved him, I would let him as he did things to my body that made me cringe, made me faint, made me cry, cause I did not know this kind of love was a lie. And this all took place at the center of Bernal Heights and all around this city, in the district surrounding, I went to schools where teachers told me I was nothing. Watch my dad get beat up, bleeding in front of me. Watch my mom get assaulted, tossed to the street, just feet in front of me. I hooked up with a lot of guys and I got drunk with all my friends to try and numb my childhood pains. I have always hated this place. For here at this place, my father went to the hospital one day and found out his disease turned to cancer. So it was right here at this place when he took his last breath, just a few months later. And I was miles and miles away, 
in the air flying to him when he went to be with Jesus that day. The best example of love I had ever known, he was just gone. And from that point on, I refused to look at this place as my home. To me, this place had stolen every good thing from me. And every time someone would talk of San Francisco or speak of Bernal Heights to me, it would make me so, so sick, filled with so much anger and so much bitterness. I thought that for the rest of my life, life I was destined to live like this but that's not what Jesus says his words are found in John 10 10 and are written saying the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness See, the enemy longs to steal our childhoods, kill our confidence, destroy our relationships, but God is desperate to give us lives that are abundant, super added, complete and perfect, above and beyond what we could imagine. And as I read this verse, as I listened to Jesus' words, I realized that this constant mourning in my heart was not what God wants. So I I screamed, God, invade these walls around my heart. Remove this anger from me. I forfeit my sin and entitlement to my sadness. Please come in and renew me. There are places and people I've allowed to control me. I hand them over. I'd rather have the life you want for me. Life in its fullness. Life more abundantly. And as I prayed these words and I sought God with all of me, as I let go of my victimized spirit and the wounds I held on to so tightly, eventually his purpose for me and his real amazing redeeming love began to restore me. And I became determined to take back what the enemy had stolen from me. In fact, it was years later, October of 2014, the day I was to marry an incredible man filled with honor and integrity. And together we chose to make a statement with our lives. Though the enemy tries to capture and distort our concepts of love and home and family and worth and our whole lives just feeds us lies in front of our friends and family, we celebrate the truth of God God's love on top of this hill at Bernal Heights. Yes, I used to hate this place, but in the name of Jesus, I reclaim this place. Satan, you no longer have this place. Though your schemes once occupied my heart, they were only paying rent. You've officially been kicked out. Your lies have been evicted, because Jesus lives here now. And that sunny day in October, blocks from the place my dad grew up at, walking distance from the place that he sold drugs at, the place in which he took his last breath at, blocks from the place I spent my childhood days looking for the wrong kinds of love at, my husband and I, both products of God's love in our lives with every vow and every scripture that we promised to each other, with every time we proclaimed what God's love had brought us through together, with every mention of the name of Jesus, whose love is far greater than either of our own. In my heart, it was like legacies were being redeemed, chains were being set free, and walls that the enemy had built were now publicly tumbling down. For many of us, we have a Bernal Heights in our lives. Maybe it's not a district. Maybe it's the school you were bullied in, the home you were beaten in, relationships you've been rejected in, or the family that your whole life has been broken and painful to be in. Or maybe it's simply the stagnant state your heart is in. Whatever it is, Jesus has come to bring light into those dark places. Through him, there is a life that is over the top and abundant. The places that used to be painful, we can bring new life in. Speaking in schools against bullying, 
being better parents than we saw our parents being, forgiving the people whose words have been stinging, going back to painful places and proclaiming Jesus, declaring his victory. Because if the enemy has come to steal, Jesus has come to reclaim. If the enemy has come to kill, Jesus has come to give life again. If the enemy has come to destroy, Jesus has come to rebuild and renew and restore in his name. So I no longer hate Bernal Heights. I've allowed God to change what it means to me. I have taken back this territory. May the generations that come after me say, I have always loved this place. Thank you so much. Join me in standing to your feet. We're going to continue in worship. We're going to worship a God who is for us. We're going to worship a God who loves us, a God who is fighting for us in the name that is above every name. No matter what you're coming in with, no matter what you're carrying, he wants to help you carry weights you weren't meant to carry. Let's encounter him today.
Come on, can we give him a shout of praise tonight? Come on. Come on, he is good. There's no one like Jesus, amen? I feel like, man, we've already had some major church tonight. The Lord is good. This is the kind of God he is out of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, all of them, and heals all your diseases, all of them. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle, eagles. Word of God, amen. Isn't that good? Psalm 103, 1 through 5, if you want to look that up later. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. When we get together, we always want to have an opportunity for you to be prayed for. We're all carrying things. Scripture tells us that the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And his word also tells us that he wants us to give us, give him our burdens because he cares for us. I don't know where your faith is tonight, but I want to just share with you, if, if your faith is wavering, if like, does God really love me? Does he care about me? Does he still heal today? Yes, he does. He loves you. He has a purpose for you. And while we sing this next song, we just want to invite you to come and kneel at the altar if you want to lay something down. If you want to come pray with someone, if you want to pray for someone else, our prayer partners would be delighted to pray with you. Um, I shared with our church this last week, I've had some spleen pain regard, related to another illness that I've had for about a year and a half. And um, about a week and a half ago in our staff meeting, um, I, I mentioned that to the staff. We were having prayer time. And um, I almost said, after I, I mentioned, I'm like, hey, would someone actually pray for healing? Because a lot of times we'll just say, hey, God, you know, be with that person. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking, would someone pray for healing? And I almost spoke up. The Holy Spirit was like, no, just shut up for a second. I've got this. And so we kept on going with prayer requests and we finished up. And um, I was like, okay, Lord, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And I have prayed for healing many times for my spleen to stop healing, it hurting, and it hadn't. Um, so during, we're just popcorn prayer. You know, people are praying. And one of the girls on our staff prayed for healing for all of us that had asked for prayer requests for our bodies. And my spleen has not hurt since then. It's been over a week and a half. Praise God. I don't know why he chose that time, but I want I want offer that story just to infuse some faith. If you think maybe God is just for somebody else, no, he's for you. If you think that God was just a God for people back in the day, for someone special, no, he's for you and he's available to you right now. So as we sing, you come, we wanna pray with you, all right? Come on. He's able, he's ready to take your burden tonight. Draw near to you, God. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty is the great I am. Who is worthy? None beside me. God Almighty, great I am. Yes, you are. Never fail. I want to be near to your heart, loving the world, hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living. Yes, God. Singing as a one. Lift it up. Sing a hallelujah. Highest praise. Holy, holy. God Almighty, the great I am. He is able. Great I am, the name above all 
mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell. from you and chose to pull us out of the pit not just make us a better version but to give us a brand new identity and name your work is complete with the blood of Jesus in us we say yes to it we say yes to you Lord thank you for the the lives that you've gathered in this place tonight the work that you've already done Lord we hear chains breaking tonight as we lift our eyes and our our face to you as we look to Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, do a mighty work as Hosanna comes and speaks to us, Lord, and shares your incredible testimony through her. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hey, why don't you turn around and just greet those around you. Give them a a high five, a holy hug. Well, hey, my new friends. I know I got to meet a handful of you before the evening started, but if we have not met yet, I did want to introduce myself. My name is Hosanna Wong. Uh, Some of you might have grown up in church and might be familiar with the word Hosanna. Some of us grew up singing songs like Hosanna in the highest. So some of you might be like, okay, a girl is here named Hosanna Wong. And you might be like, oh, Hosanna Wong. Maybe like a Chinese worship leader is here to sing some tunes. Something between Lauren Daigle and Mulan is about to happen right now. That's not what's going to happen right now. I didn't grow up singing, but I did grow up doing spoken word poetry um, from Bernal Heights. And I grew up on the streets where my dad led um, people to Jesus on the streets of San Francisco my whole life. And I got to learn spoken word poetry from the streets. And spoken word poetry was always the way 
that I was able to share about Jesus with my friends. And so I'm just so truly blessed that I get to share about Jesus who spoke more poetry with more friends. This is awesome. And I wanted to uh, tell you, since I'm meeting many of you for the first time, a little bit about my lens of the church since I grew up in somewhat of a different church environment. I see now, now that I'm older, how blessed I was to have been raised by a recovered addict. I knew every day of my childhood that Jesus was real because I saw what Jesus could do. Um, but I will say that even though I'm proud of the streets that I'm from and I'm very proud of the unique church environment I was raised in, after my dad passed away, I had other environments within Christ following communities that weren't as positive. And maybe you too can relate. If you heard things you know you weren't meant to hear or you felt things you know you weren't meant to feel or if you ever felt like you weren't welcomed or you didn't fit in or the cliques were far too cool for you and you couldn't tell who even liked God or liked people, I remember being so deeply wounded by people I thought I could trust that it made me have a really hard heart towards the church. And so 15 years ago, I started traveling the country to talk about Jesus through spoken word poetry, but I considered myself uh, church adjacent. I thought, I'm down for Jesus, but not Jesus people. <laughs> like, I like God, but if that's what God's people are like, I don't think that's for me. And I remember 15 years ago, I, I packed my life into suitcases. I started traveling the country for what I thought was going to be three months, sharing about Jesus through spoken word poetry in prisons, recovery ministries, and beautiful churches like yours. It ended up being about four and a half years without a home base. And instead, all of these pastors and their wives housed me all over the country. And I went from cot in living room to cot in living room to guest room to guest room. Some churches have like a mother-in-law in the back of the building where they have like their missionaries. I stayed in a lot of those. And this was across denominations, across cultures, across state lines. And as all these families from churches all over America housed me and I had holidays with them and meals with them and I got real with them about where I've really been, about what I really feel about the things I really regretted, about the questions I really had, and I wasn't met with shame or condemnation. I saw a different side of the church. I saw the beauty of what the church could be and that I could be a part of helping create the community I longed for. And I want you to know that's why I'm so blessed to be with all of you today, to be with this beautiful church, Houston First Baptist Cypress. If you're looking for a good church, come here on Sunday. There's two services. I'm so blessed to be in a place where people can just get real and know God for real and love people for real and figure it out together. I'm truly so blessed to be a part of a church like that. So could you just join me in thanking and honoring everyone at this church, all the volunteers, everyone on staff that made this possible. I never could have imagined this as a kid. This is so cool. Hey, before I start, I wanted to, ooh, praise God, I wanted to give away two of my new books. Um, one, because I believe everyone's love language is free things. Um, and two, you know your Chinese sister is going to hook you up with a deal. So I want to give these two books away to two people. One, this is a book about knowing who you are and how to live like it. So the first half is about who you are and the second half is about rhythms to know how. And so I want to give this book to two people. One who is someone that says, I need some new rhythms. I've been following Jesus for a long time, but I just want a fresh breath for my real life today. I'm just passionate about having new rhythms in my real life. And then the second person I want to give this to is someone that says, I know someone who needs the first half of the book. I know someone who needs to know who they are in Christ, and I want to give it to them. I'm a gift giver. So I want to give it to these two people. And then here's the last stipulation. You have to also be a baller on a budget who is saying, Hosanna, I want the book, but I can't afford it right now. And me and my spouse have already done budget planning for the year. So save me and my marriage and please give me this. I am for your marriage and I would love to gift this to you. So if you're either one of those two people and you're willing to come up and get the book, would you just raise your hand? Who's here? The readers in the room. Right here, both of you? Will you give it to different people? Okay, one of you and then one of somebody else. One of you and somebody else, right here. And right behind, yes, come over here. Can you give it up for our new friends? Praise the Lord. Okay. What's your name? Tiffany. Tiffany. What's your name? Yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm Hosanna. I'm going to give you these books. Um, after this, I'd love to sign them with, for you or your gifts, whoever. But I also, yes, all the signing you want, my queen. Um, also, I want you to know that I'm going to preach off of this message. So if you hate this message, <laughs> give this book to someone you hate. <laughs> and that will show them. That will show them. Tonight, I want to talk about 
how, how we can know who we really are and live like it every single day. I want to talk about how. I remember growing up, junior high was about the time when all the kids started coming to school wearing cool brands. And I remember thinking, I want to wear the cool brands. Like, how do you know what those are? There wasn't internet back then. And so I remember just being so obsessed with wanting to fit in, so obsessed with wanting to wear what everyone else was wearing or look like how everyone else was looking like. And I was so desperate to figure out what the cool brands were. And so I remember there was a time when a new store came into my hood. Now, I grew up in the hood, like the hood hood. And so when this new store came in, everyone was saying, oh, man, this store is going to up the value of the whole neighborhood. This store is nice. This store is bougie. Only my rich aunties go to this store. And I thought, whatever that store is, I'm going to buy clothes from there. So I want you to think about what you think this store could have been. I'm in junior high, and this store is brand new in our world. Could you just turn to someone next to you and guess what you think this store is? It's super cool. Only rich people can go there. Just imagine, I'm in junior high in this story, so you have to kind of like think, think back a little. Not too much, but like a little. The day came. It was grand opening week, the first time this store was in the Bay Area in California. And it was in my hood. And the doors opened, and I was there opening week. And I walked in, and the store was Jamba Juice. <laughs> Jamba Juice had just made its way onto the scene and into our hearts, the smoothie sensation, okay? If you've never been, go get yourself a mango go-go and bless your life in the presence of God. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And I will tell you, forget the fact that it's not technically a clothing brand. I just saw that they had merch. And I thought, if I just wear all of this merch, I'll probably be cool. And there was a girl who went to our church who worked at the Jamba Juice who hooked your girl up with a Jamba Juice t-shirt and a Jamba Juice tote bag and a Jamba Juice hat. And I remember thinking, I need to wear all of these things together because, you know, cool people match. And I remember wearing that whole ensemble to school once a week every week for a month and a half until one day my dad said to me, Hosanna, is it career day again? <laughs> and then I knew I had to retire the jersey. It was no longer time for my Jamba Juice fashion <laughs> icon moment. But I remember being so obsessed with what people thought about me. I would do anything to fit in. I would do anything to feel valuable. I would do anything to feel loved. And so much more than just changing the clothes I wore, hoping that I looked like other kids in my class. I remember growing up always feeling like I was not enough, so I kept living like I was not enough. I didn't feel like my family was enough. My dad had a different background than my friend's dad's backgrounds. I didn't feel like my church was enough. Our church to our friends living on the streets wasn't the same as my friend's churches. And I remember feeling like I just couldn't fit in. I felt like I wasn't churchy enough for my church friends, and I was too churchy for my unchurched friends. I constantly felt like I had to be a different version of myself everywhere I went because I didn't feel like any place really was made for me. I remember feeling like I was not enough. My family had less money than all my friends' families. I was the only Chinese girl in my class. And then when my dad passed away when I was 18 years old, I remember not knowing who I am or why I'm here. And I still believed that there was a God. I was just mad at God. And I remember just finding my identity and what all the girls thought about me, what boys wanted to date me, what I was wearing, if I fit in, who told me I was loved that week. Here's the truth about all of our lives. What you think about yourself determines how you live. So if you believe that you're not enough, you'll start living like you're not enough. You might try to change yourself or change the details about yourself so that you can be more accepted. You might try to do more or carry more or hustle harder or produce more in order to prove your value. If you believe that you are a burden to be loved, you'll start living like you are. You might stop wanting to open up to people. You might start isolating yourself because you're convinced that people will probably be annoyed by you. 
So you don't want to tell people what you're really going through, and you don't even want to tell them your prayer requests because you think that they'll think you're weird, and you don't want to even tell them your big dreams because you think they'll try to avoid you, and you've convinced yourself that you are a burden to be loved, and now you've started living like you are. If you believe that you are a failure, you'll start living like you are. You might believe that anything you put your hands to will fail. You might believe that you'll always make the same mistakes you once did. You'll always trust the wrong people like you once did. You'll always invest too much money in that project like you once did. You might start to believe that anything you want or dream of, even the things you feel God has called you to, no matter what you touch, it eventually will fail. Let me tell you this. The enemy of our soul's hopes that we believe all of these lies. He hopes we believe we're not enough, that we're a burden to be loved, that we're a failure because the enemy knows who we really are. He's on this whole mission to make sure we don't find out too because he knows that if we discovered that we are loved by God and chosen by God and created with a purpose and safe in the hands of God, we would start living like we are. And children of God, knowing who we really are and then living like it is the enemy's greatest threat. If you have ever struggled with knowing who you really are and how to actually live like it, you're not crazy. You've been told lies your whole life. I came here tonight to tell someone, you are more than you've been told. And God knew that throughout our lives, we would hear all of these lies from the people we grew up with, from people we went to school with, from people we work with, from our own thoughts. He knew that we would start to see ourselves through the broken lens of other people. So God sent a solution. He sent his son, Jesus, to come and be with us to share in our human experience, to be tempted like we're tempted, to hear lies like we've heard lies, and to forgive us, to heal us, to die for our sins and cover us, and show us how a human can still, with all the lies, with all the opinions, with all the pressure, know who we really are and live like it every single day. Jesus himself is going to show us how. I want to share with you one story um, that I grew up hearing, that I grew up reading about. But it wasn't until this past season of my life when I saw something in it that I used to miss. In fact, it's such a well-known verse, and I know it's a big verse here at this church. that It's not even on the screens. You might know it by heart. But just in case you're a note taker, it's Matthew 4. 1820, write it down, fact check me later. You got to fact check your Bible teachers. Matthew 4, 1820, and here's the story. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. This is what I used to miss. The place those boys were at when Jesus came to them and said, come and follow me, the place they were in their life, in their mindset, is actually a place I've found myself time and time again. And I wonder if it's a state of mind you can relate to as well. To unpack what the significance of this story is. We're just going to go to school really quick. We're going to go back to school really quick to unpack the first century Jewish educational system. So we're just going to go back to school really quick. And if you've never had a Chinese teacher before, let me tell you, A pluses only. Okay. Praise the Lord. There was three levels of schooling back in the day in the first Jewish educational system. The first level, students would be ages 6 to 10. And they were required to memorize the first five books of the Bible, what was written at that time. They had to memorize those scrolls. And if you're thinking, that's insane, not everyone can do that, you're right. 
Not everyone could do that. Many had to go back home and they couldn't continue on for schooling. Many of them were not good enough. But the best of the best who could do that went on to the second level of schooling. And at this level, students are on 10 to 14, 10 to 15, and now they're memorizing the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, and now they're also learning critical thinking skills, how to analyze the scriptures, how to apply the scriptures, how to answer questions and maybe ask questions back. And not everybody could do this. Not everybody was good enough. Some of them had to go back home and say, I almost made it, but then I just fell short. Not everyone was good enough. But the best of the best were, and they got to go to the third level of schooling. And this was a whole other level of schooling. Just imagine Harvard or Yale admissions times 10. And a student would audition for the teacher, audition for the rabbi. And the rabbi, the teacher, would grill the student. How well did they know this chapter? How well did they know this story? Could they say it backwards? Could they answer this question? Could they ask a question back? How well could they apply it? How well were their critical thinking skills? And if the teacher thought that that student was good enough, this student is brighter than the other students, quicker than the other students, has better memorization skills than the other students. This student had parents that could afford the best tutors. This student had a community that loved them and supported them and helped them study. This kid has what it takes. They're better than the other students. This kid is good enough. Historically, the teacher would look to the student and say, come and follow me. And students longed to hear those words because what it literally meant is that they would leave their town, their family, their synagogue, and they got to follow this teacher follow this rabbi and learn their lifestyle. How did they plan their weeks? How did they have relationships? How did they rest? What was their philosophy? What was their theology? They would literally follow that teacher to discover who they were and also how to live. But if a teacher thought that that student didn't have what it took, this student didn't have parents who could afford the best tutors, this student didn't have a community that knew them, supported them, and helped them study. This student isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. This student is smart, but not the very specific kind of smart that I'm looking for. If that student wasn't good enough, the teacher would look at the student and say, go home and ply your trade, which meant go home to the family business. Go home and do what your daddy does. Your daddy, who was also not good enough to follow any teachers. Go back home and do what everyone else in your no good for nothing town does. You're not good enough to follow me. This changes this story a little bit when we realize that Jesus was not sitting behind an admissions desk or sitting behind an American Idol like judge's desk seeing who could perform the best, who can sing the highest note, or who can impress the most people. But Jesus went to where they were. And he met them at their boats, holding on to their nets. Because they were fishermen. Why were they fishermen? Because they had already been told that they were not good enough to do anything else. They were there doing their daddy's trade. They were there doing their grandfather's trade. They had already done their best to try to hit the mark, their best to do what was expected of them, and had already been told that they did not have what it took. Have you ever been in a place where your dreams were so close, but you didn't get what you had hoped for? Have you ever been in a place where you see favor and opportunity for other people around you, but you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick? Have you ever felt like you did your best and you tried your hardest, but you feel like you've disappointed yourself and you've disappointed the people around you? Jesus met these boys where they were. And as he meets them where they are, he calls them to do three things. Three things that I believe he's calling all of us to do today. I just want to share these th three things with you before we close tonight. The three things Jesus invites them to do that he's inviting us to do today too. And if you would like to take notes, these are going to be up on the screens. The first thing Jesus calls them to do is drop the old 
name. As they're holding on to their nets, they're holding on to a symbol of defeat, a story of why they're not good enough and they'll never be good enough. And as Jesus met them where they were, as they were holding on to a mentality of defeat, a mindset of defeat, Jesus was inviting them to drop the old name. And that's the same thing he's inviting us to do as well. You may have been told that you're not good enough. You may have been told that you'll always be a failure. You may have been told that your life is not as important as other people's lives. You may have been told that you'll always be defined by your mistakes. You may have been told that you have to do more and hustle hard and produce more in order to be valuable. But Jesus was saying to them the same thing he's saying to us today. You are more than you've been told. And perhaps nobody else has told you this, but you are valuable. Perhaps nobody else has told you this, but you are loved. Perhaps nobody has told you this, but you don't have to stay stuck in your past. You can live a life that is healed and whole and filled with purpose. Come and follow me and I'm going to show you the truth of who you are. And Jesus invites us to do that same thing today. He's saying drop the old name that you've accepted from people who have no power to define you. Drop the old story that someone told you that you believed and you've repeated of why you'll never be good enough, of why God can never use you, of why your life will never make an impact. Jesus was trying to help them do what he's trying to help us do, which is to see us through the correct lens that perhaps some of us were not taught growing up. He wants us to drop the old name and then he says, come and follow me. The second thing Jesus invites us to do, he says, drop the old name and then follow Jesus for real. Follow Jesus for real. What does it look like in 2024 to follow Jesus actually? Not just as an over our heads, inspirational, abstract way, but practically and tangibly in our lives, in our busy schedules, with our messy relationships, what does it look like to actually follow him? Recently, my husband Guy, uh, my husband Guy and I just celebrated our nine-year wedding anniversary. Oh, praise God. Do I get claps for that? I'll receive it. Thank you. It has truly been the best nine years of his life. He is, he is so blessed. So thank you. I'll let him know you clapped for that. We recently celebrated our nine-year um, anniversary. I met my husband because I was traveling around the country being housed by all these awesome families and teaching, performing at churches and, and, and events. And he was one of the pastors at a church in Las Vegas that had invited me. And I met him there. And you're not supposed to pick your favorite churches. But when you go for a job and you leave with a husband, it's at least top ten. Yeah, I still tithe there sometimes. Like, thank you for what you did for me. Praise God. Um, and so we had our nine-year wedding anniversary, and I was going uh, back to that church in Las Vegas to teach. And my husband was like, let's make a whole event out of it. Let's make a whole trip out of it. We're going to do like an anniversary date in the city we met in. And he took me to my very first Cirque de Soleil show. Is anyone familiar with this? This girl from Bernal Heights had never heard of it. If you have never heard of it, let me tell you, it's like a cinematic acrobatic experience. It's like the modern day circus. You have people flipping and doing somersaults in the air and they're hanging from poles and flying from one end to the other and they're wearing feathers and glitter. It's incredible. And maybe it was pure ignorance or maybe it was pure bliss. But at the end of the show, I'm walking out with my husband and I look back into the room we were just in and I said, I want to do that. <laughs> I said, do you think, do you think I could do that? Um, and because he wants a happy life, he wants a happy wife. And so he immediately said, yes, my love, I believe you can do that. And then I took a step towards the room and I said, do you think, do you think I could do that right now? And he said, no. <laughs> and then he said this. He said, you would have to train. You would have to practice. 
they weren't able to do all of that because they just tried really hard in a moment. They have a whole lifestyle preparing them for that moment. He said, the only reason you were able to see them do all that in public is because of the lifestyle they live in private. The same is true when it comes to following Jesus. I wish I would have known this earlier in my life. Jesus does not expect for you to give your life to him and then all of a sudden you know exactly what to do in every situation. You don't even need those WWJD bracelets because you know it by heart. You know who you are. You know how to live. Come what may. People can lie to you. You know how to handle every situation. No. Jesus said, come and follow me, and I'm going to show you my lifestyle. The same invitation he made to his disciples, those students, those apprentices, he's making to us. Come and follow me, and I'm going to show you a new way to live. I'm going to show you how I live. I'm going to show you how I plan my weeks, how I have relationships, how I have boundaries, how I rest, my philosophy, my theology. I'm going to show you who you really are, and I'm going to show you how to live. Drop the old name and come and follow me. Jesus knew that in order for us to live the lives we say we want to live in public, it will mean changing the way that we live in private. The rhythms of Jesus. We give our lives to Jesus and then we follow him for real by living the way that he lived. By literally living out his lifestyle. And for the sake of time, I just want to share with you four. Four rhythms of Jesus. There's many. We could talk for hundreds of years about all the ways we can follow Jesus. But I want to just highlight to you four. If you're here today and you have never given your life to Jesus before and you know today is the day. You're not sure about how other people are following Jesus. You can't really tell where you fit, but you know that you fit with Jesus. And you want to follow him for real in your real life without any ounce of faking it. I want to show you four rhythms you can do after today. You can give your life to Jesus today. And these are four rhythms you can continue with throughout your life to follow him for real. Or maybe you have followed Jesus for a long time. But these past couple years, you can feel that your relationship has grown apathetic stale, routine, and you want to know Jesus in a deeper way, a real way in your real life today, not the way you followed him 10 years ago, but today. And so you might say, I want a fresh way to follow the rhythms of Jesus. I just want to unpack four of these rhythms for all of us today. They're going to be on the screens. One is engaging in God's word. There is a story of Jesus um, when he's a teenager and he's on a road trip with his family and then he goes out of his way, off the path everyone else was on, to go into a temple, which is where the only place where you could read the scrolls, what was written from the Bible at that time. And Jesus showed us an example. His disciples would have seen him do things like this throughout his life when they were looking at Jesus about how to live. Jesus would go off the path everyone else was on to be in a place where the word of God was. And I didn't write reading God's word. I wrote engaging in God's word because some of us, not all of us, but some of us were raised around people who may have emphasized to us that we need to read the Bible more and read the Bible more. And if you read the Bible more, then you're more Christ-like. And if you read the Bible more, then you're more saved. And I actually think that premise was really, really good, but it was a little bit incomplete. Because the point was not to just read, read, read as if in your, you're some kind of marathon and you're going to outread everybody. The point was always to really engage with what God said and to know what God really says about you. So for you, it might not be speed. It might be reading the Psalms slowly. It might be reading the Gospels communally. It might be that you've known the Bible because you've read it your whole life. And this year, you want a new translation. You've read it NIV your whole life. And next year, you're reading it NLT. I don't know what it is for you. I know for me, when I got the crazy privilege, it's another story, of leading my baby brother to Jesus, I had to find a translation he understood. And then he got to understand who Jesus was. And then when he wanted to go deeper into scripture, I got him a new Bible of the new translation. This is my point. Yes, we need to read God's word. But it's more important that you engage with what it says than reading it more and better than everyone else around you. And the way that you read the word might not be the same way your mom reads the word. Or the way your pastor reads the word. Or the way you read the word 10 years ago. 
if you feel like your time with God and in his word has grown stale and routine, I would just encourage you to find a fresh way to really engage with God's word. Whether it's a different time of day, a different translation, I don't know what it is for you, but don't just read it. Engage on it and know it. The second rhythm of Jesus is prayer. Jesus had a rhythm of going out of his way to be alone with God. Like many of us, Jesus had a busy life. He had a lot of responsibilities. Family responsibilities, mission responsibilities, he had a pretty important calling. And all the time, people had ideas of what he should do next and where he should minister next. And Jesus knew where to go next, what to do next, what God was calling him to do next, because Jesus fought to spend alone time with God. To give us and his students, his apprentices, his disciples, and all of us an example of how we too will have to go out of our way to be alone with God. Going to our car, locking the doors so we can have quiet time with God. Going on walks after work before you go home in the evening to pray. Waking up earlier, going to bed later. Jesus is praying in the morning and the afternoon at night. This is not just for morning people. Jesus was saying you're going to have to go out of your way to actually spend time with God. The third rhythm is rest. Jesus had a rhythm that he wanted us to see. I love that Jesus accomplished everything God had called him to do, everything he was put on earth for. But he rested. He rested with his friends. He rested with a small group of friends, a lot of friends by himself. He constantly had a rhythm of rest. God knew that throughout our lives we would believe the lie that we have to do more, produce more to be loved. So God commanded rest and then Jesus exemplified rest. So if we followed him for real, we would also demonstrate rest in our real lives. So we can declare bodily and vocally that we are loved even before we do one thing. And the fourth rhythm I want to share with you is the rhythm of real community. Real community. I don't mean your home girl of 40 years who lives on your same block and you go to the same concerts and you wear the same jean size and you all share jeans. Something like the sister of the traveling pants and Bible studies for all. That's not what I mean. That's not what he's real life. I mean real community the way that Jesus demonstrated community actually in his life, which was through two ways. One, confession, and two, celebration. You'll see Jesus doing this and his disciples doing this all throughout the New Testament. Real community, confession, getting real about what you're really going through. And celebration, celebrating what God has already done and is currently doing. These are commands from God and rhythms from Jesus. Jesus wanted to make sure that we were in real community. And look, we're doing that tonight. Some of us didn't come because we felt like it. Some of us had a really hard week. Some of us didn't come because it was convenient. I met someone who drove hours from another state to be with us tonight. But we have chosen to follow Jesus for real. So we come to church and we come to events like this to be around people who are just getting real and want to know Jesus for real. Because we're saying we follow Jesus for real. We want to be in real community. Jesus demonstrated these rhythms to his disciples for them to see and for us to see. So we could follow Jesus without any ounce of faking it. So we can look at our real lives and our real schedules and follow him for real. And this is what I want to share with you. Your relationship with Jesus does not have to look like anyone else's relationship with Jesus. It just has to be real and honest and ongoing. A one-on-one -on -one ongoing conversational relationship is what Jesus wants to have with you. Your relationship with Jesus doesn't have to look like it did 20 years ago or four years ago, or how you hope it will look in this ideal life you think you'll have in a couple years. I mean Jesus in your real life. That's the invitation today. So the fight for your life, if you want to know who you really are and how to live like it, the fight for your life might look like fighting for your schedule. Looking at your real life. It's March 1st, by the way. If some of you didn't know, we're now in March. Yes, come to church. We share lots of important things here. Welcome to March 2024. It's a whole thing. Look at your month and see what is my real life like. How will I follow Jesus for real this month? These days I can engage with his word. Here, here. This is going to be like a morning. This is going to be like an afternoon. How am I going to engage in praying? I think this day and this day. Oh, I can't that day. Maybe this day. I don't know. When am I going to rest? Oh, it's not the same day every week. That's okay. This week here, this week here, this week here, this week here. 
How am I engaged in real community? These three, it's church. This week I'm out of town Sunday, so it's going to be a group in the middle of the week. I mean, your real life, how will you follow Jesus for real? Because the truth is you will know who you really are when you spend real time with the one who knows you the best. To live as who you are in public, it will mean changing the way that you live in private. Jesus said, drop the old name, follow me for real, and then here's the final thing Jesus invited them to do. Answer to a new name. Answer to who you really are. Jesus said to them, I'm going to make you fishers of people. And I used to, if you may be familiar with this verse, if you've never been to church before, you may not be familiar with this verse. I grew up believing that this verse meant when Jesus said, now I'm make you fishers of people, it meant that now you're going to join me and we're going to invite more people to follow me. Now you're going to partner with me and we're going to tell more people how much God loves them. We're going to tell more people they're more than they've been told. We're going to tell more people that they're valuable and loved. Now you're going to be fishers of people. We're going to go and get people to know God and have a new life too. And it does mean that. And also... As Jesus was making a point to say, I'm going to make you fishers of people. Jesus was making a point to say who he was going to use and what he was going to use to do it. And Jesus was saying, when he said, I want to make you fishers of people, Jesus was saying, I want to use the thing that other people used to point at to tell you you're disqualified. Jesus was saying, I want to use the thing that you used to point at as a symbol of why you're a little too different. Jesus was saying, I want to use the thing that other people used to use to tell you you're out. That's the thing we're going to use to tell more people that they're in. Jesus was saying, other people tore you down because you're just a fisherman. I am saying, thank God you're a fisherman. I've been looking for a fisherman. I want to use what being a fisherman has taught you. I want to use what your daddy's trade has taught you. I want to use what your hometown has taught you. I want to use what your background has taught you. In fact, it's everything you are and everything you've overcome and where you're from and in your lens of the world. In fact, it's your exact details that I want to use in this exact moment in time. Everything the enemy wanted to use to pull you back, that's what I want to use to propel you forward. And that is the same thing God is saying to us tonight. Before we close out this night, I just want you to know, who does God want to use and what does God want to use? God wants to use the resilience that came out of that one season that you thought you wouldn't survive, but you did. God wants to use the character that came out of that one season when you had integrity when nobody else was looking. God wants to use the humility that came out of that one season when nothing went the way you wanted. But you trusted God and you surrendered to God and you depended on God's power and not your own. God is saying everything the enemy wanted to use to take you out is what I want to use to bring you forward and to join me on my mission for everyone to know who they really are. Drop the old name. Follow Jesus for real and answer to a new name. Answer to who you really are. Is it cool if, as we close this evening if I share one more spoken word poem with you? Is that okay? I'm going to bring the band up. We're going to do one more. I asked if I could share one more spoken word piece and... I wanted to share this very specific spoken word piece because it came out of a season of defeat. A season that is very similar to the place those boys were at in their boats, with their nets. The opinions of people had weighed them down. I was in a season I wrote this poem during a season that maybe some of you can relate to. It was one of the most painful seasons of my life. It was one of the most painful seasons of our marriage. My husband Guy would tell you he, he couldn't recognize his wife. We had a season of um, immense loss. Physically, financially, 
relationally. The people we thought would stay didn't. The people we thought would defend us didn't. I had so much shame and I lost who I was. I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know how to live like it. And the fight for my life came by fighting for my schedule. I couldn't follow Jesus the way I used to and I certainly couldn't follow him like anyone else in my life. And the fight for my life was not public, it was private and it was not cute. Alone in my hand-me-down on my hand-me-down couch in our apartment. And I remember just fighting to spend real time alone with God and in being in real prayer, getting real with God about things I was really going through. I remember fighting to spend time and to rest, which is unnatural for me. And unnatural, I think, for many of us to follow Jesus that way. I started to fight to spend time with God and being in real community. Even though being social is so very hard and it's getting harder and the enemy wants to give us every device and reason to not be social and not follow Jesus, I had a fight to be in a community like the church again. And then I had a fight to um, engage in God's word. I had a fight to... I got a new translation. I started reading it at a different time of day. I started reading it with a friend, so we talked about it. I needed a fresh way to see God's word. And I started reading God's words. You can go ahead. I started, um, I started memorizing names that God called me. I started memorizing what God said about me, trying to make God's voice the loudest voice in my life. This is what I want you to know that I wish I would have known. years ago on that couch. You deserve to stop seeing yourself through the broken lens of other people. When you start seeing yourself through the lens of God, you will discover who you really are and who you've always been. Spend real time with the one who knows you the best. He will show you who you are and how to live like it. This is a spoken word piece that came out of that season. It was first just for me to declare what God said about me, but I wanna share it with you because I want you to have a sneak preview of what you'll discover about you when you fight to spend time to see what God, your creator says about you. Thanks for letting me share this spoken word poem. This is called, I Have a New Name. God spends a lot of time in the Bible telling us who we are. It's almost as if he knew that we would doubt who that was from time to time. It's as if he saw it coming, that we'd spend our whole lives searching for what our identity, what our real name was, and that there'd be many moments in our lives where we'd let different kinds of names define us when we've looked in the mirror, compared ourselves to pictures and heard the name ugly. When we've been left by loved ones, people we trusted once and heard the name unworthy. When we've been drowning in discouragement, living in a seemingly never ending crisis and heard the name forgotten. When we've had our hopes up and our hearts open only to be brought down by closed doors and we've heard rejected. When we've looked for infinite affirming love through lesser physical fleshly versions. When we gave it away or when it was stolen and we heard impure we heard garbage when we go to other vices to ease our pain and we hear addict we hear forever broken when we feel like we're living in the shadow of someone else's calling and we hear second place when our pain cripples us to a point where we don't even know how to let others in. And we hear lonely when our past seems too gross for others to forgive and we hear disgusting. It's overwhelming. These voices we're constantly hearing. It's suffocating. This air of constant critique 
and comparing. And it's sort of amazing the people whose voices I've allowed to name me. The power I've given to my past, to my mirror, and to my surroundings and enabled them to identify me. The amount of years I've spent living up to whatever others say about me. But God says something else about me. It's like he knew there would be other voices. So he wrote his voice down in a timeless book of truths that would remind us over and over again in the moments when lies would block his truths and somehow make us forget. So I'm going back to the source, not the people I've allowed to represent God to me, but the actual, literal, tangible words that he has written down for me. And there's some other names he's given to me. John 15, 15, he calls me his friend. First Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls me chosen. Ephesians 2, 10, he calls me his masterpiece. He calls me his art. He calls me handmade. He calls me purposed and fashioned for good things. First Corinthians 6, 19, he calls my body a temple. He calls it the residence of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8, he calls me his messenger to the world. Galatians 3, 326 he calls me his child Romans 5 8 he calls me greatly loved John 8 36 he calls me free free indeed second Corinthians 5 17 he calls me brand new and it's amazing how different these names are from the names I'm used to listening to. And in my journey to discover who I really am in my battle to uncover the truths of myself I've learned something new about my name, and now this is what I am certain of. My name is not the name the world calls me. My name is not the name my past calls me. My name is not even the name my own mirror calls me, but my name, my name is the name I choose to answer to. And I can choose today from this moment forward to answer to a new name. When I hear lonely, that's not me. When I hear disgusting, that's not me. When I hear unworthy, I don't even look over my shoulder. When I hear broken, they must have confused me. Please look elsewhere. When I hear ugly, abandoned, useless, forgotten, I figure someone just has to remind them. Maybe those were my old names, but they're no longer the names that I will respond to. My name is the name I have chosen to spend my days living up to. And if these these other voices are not saying the same thing that the truth is. I look in my mirror and I repeat this. They have no right to be speaking to you. When you stop answering to all your old names, they will stop having power over you. The names that my father, eternity's author, the world's creator has called me are the only names that I answer to. So when I hear friend of God, that's my name. Chosen, that's my name. Loved, wanted, created with a purpose, that's my name. God's a masterpiece, that's my name. God's a messenger, that's my name. Child of God, you must be looking for me. Greatly loved, you must be calling for me. Brand new, that is my name. So that is a name that I will respond to because the enemy has no power here. Perfect love cast out all our fears and perfect love has named me and you. So what is your new name? What is stirring up inside of you when you hear these words that his word, that the word has proclaimed? What do you know is the name God is calling you? Maybe it's not the name you grew up with. Maybe it's not the name your old friends associate you with. Maybe it's not the name that your whole life you were used to identifying with, but it's the name you now answer to. So when the enemy tries to get to you, it's just the name you introduce yourself with. 
as for me. My name is forgiven. My name is free. My name is brand new, loved, wanted, child of God, created with a purpose. And it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, family. We're gonna put all nine names from the Word of God on the screens behind me. You can take a seat because we're gonna do something a little special right now. I don't know what you've been told in your life. If you've been told that you're not enough, that you're not as important as other people, that your mistakes will always define you, that you have to do more to prove your value. I don't know what you've been told, but this is what God, your creator says about you. And no one has the power to define you, but the one who created you. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna say all nine of these names from the word of God again. And when you hear the name that you wanna answer to, the name that right now is stirring up inside of you, in a second, when I get to that name, in a second, in that moment, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet and stay standing as your brothers and sisters are gonna join you in answering to their new names. And if you gotta to answer to a couple of new names, that's cool. You raise your hand to every single one. There's two that I'm answering to tonight. And here's the thing. You are all of these names. When you give your life to Jesus through Christ, God calls you all of these names. But I believe that sometimes there is a specific lie that we need to speak a specific truth to. And that's what I wanna do tonight with you today. So I'm gonna call upon nine of these names. When you hear the name you're answering to, I want you to stand to your feet and stay standing. Raise your hand to everyone you're agreeing with. I'm gonna start with friend. I'm gonna end with child of God. And as everyone's standing at the end, I'm gonna give an invitation if you wanna give your life to Jesus tonight. Maybe you've never made the choice to follow Jesus for real. And you don't wanna wait another day. You wanna know him for real today. I wanna give you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus today at the end of all these names. And we have people who are gonna pray for you and you have a church here that would love to have you. So if you're here today and you wanna to answer to John 15, 15, he calls you his friend. Would you just stand up to your feet if you're answering to friend? I see you, sir, in the back. I see you, friend, right here. Stand to your feet if you're answering to friend. If you're answering to friend, stay standing. If you're answering to friend, you're saying, God's on my side. God has my back. Even if no one else goes with me, even if no one else believes me, I'm not abandoned, I'm not alone. God said, I am his friend. God is on my side. Stay standing if you're answering a friend. Who here needs to answer to chosen? We're gonna join those who are saying they're friends. Come calling up the chosen. First Thessalonians 1, 4, you are saying I'm chosen. I'm not here by mistake. I'm not here because someone else died or someone else was fired. I am here with the authority from God. I have been chosen where I am, the way I am, because the creator of the universe thought it was important that I was here. I see you chosen. I see you group in the back. Let's call up masterpieces. Stay standing, everyone, and let's join masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10, who is saying, I am God's masterpiece. God doesn't make mistakes. Every detail of your life, he handmade on purpose and he wants to use for your good and his glory. You are no knockoff brand. You are designer made. You are bougie in the name of Jesus. You're a masterpiece. God made you with his hands. He's glad that he made you the way that he made you. Who here needs to answer the temple? First Corinthians 6, 19, he called your body a temple. Who will stand and raise your hand and say, my body is a temple? I don't know what was said about you. I don't know who touched you. I don't know what was said about you behind closed doors. I don't know what the doctor said, but I know as a fellow temple, you and I have the authority every day to look in the mirror and say, man, I already look good today because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And there is no person and there is no diagnosis that can take away what God has already put inside. You are a temple where the Holy Spirit lives and your body is good. Who here needs to answer to Acts 1-8? He calls you his messenger to the world. Who here needs to say, I wanna share the gospel with the people in my real life. I wanna share my story with my family. I wanna share my story with my friends. I am God's messenger to show his love to the people right next to me. I see you messenger in the back. Who here needs to answer to John 8:36? He calls you free, free indeed. Oh my goodness, it's like a free section. 
who is saying I'm free from my old ways, I'm free from my old names, I'm free from my old mentalities, I'm free from the old lens I used to look at myself through, I'm free from my old addictions, I am free indeed. Who here needs to answer to brand new? 2 Corinthians 5.17, he calls you brand new. You're saying I'm a new person with a new life, with a new lens. Who here needs to stand and answer to greatly loved? Romans 5.8, you're raising your hand, you're saying I'm loved. Even if other people didn't love me, even if other people didn't choose me, God said, before you chose me, I chose you. You're already greatly loved. And finally, the name that encapsulates all the names. Who here needs to stand or raise your hand? A child of God. Child of God, you're saying, I don't have to earn it. The audition is over. I don't have to impress anybody. I am loved by God. I'm his child. If you are here today and you've never made the choice to give your life to Jesus, we want to invite you to do that here today. If you're here and you're saying, I want to follow him for real, here's what we're going to do in a second. In a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Just in a second. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and keep it raised. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's from the Bible. All you have to do is believe it in your heart and mean it and say it out loud. And you're going to repeat after me. But you're not going to repeat after me alone. Everyone else in the room who's already given our lives to Jesus, we're going to join you. We're going to add on to your faith, and we're, they're going to repeat after me too. So everyone in the room who's ready to give your life to Jesus, say this prayer with them, and we're going to add on to their faith and say it together. And if you're here and you're giving your life to Jesus, after we say this prayer, we have our prayer team up front with you. They would love to pray for you and invite you into the family of God and invite you into this church and also if you have any prayer requests at all we would love to pray for you it's going to be they're going to be up here during the song and after the song to pray for you for giving your life to jesus so if you're here today and you're saying i want to follow jesus for real without any ounce of faking it i want to follow jesus on the count of three would you just shoot your hand up in the air and keep it up on the count of three one two three hands in the air if you're saying i'm giving my life to jesus i see you ma'am i see you sir i see you family in the back i see you sir i see you ma'am I see you, friends. I see you, couple back. I see you, sir. Would you keep your hands up? I'm going to lead you in scripture. Believe it in your heart. Repeat after me and everyone else in the room who's already given your life to Jesus. Would you pray this with me? Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died and rose again. You are my Savior. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my shame. I want a new name. I want a new life. Amen and amen. Hey, if you've gave your life to Jesus, come up to the front and receive prayer. We have our prayer team here, and we would love for you to join us on Sunday as well. Hey, would you stay standing? We're going to sing this song out with the team as who we really are. Love y'all. You call.
time. What an amazing instrument of God. So, so amazing. Hey, if you would, before you go, it's just like we started. Hold your hands out like this and we pray over you. Thanks so much for coming. Jesus, we honor your name. We thank you that you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. Just take a moment. The things that God spoke to you tonight, tell them right now, I believe you. I believe you. I believe this is not just an inspirational moment. I believe you're changing my identity tonight. Help me to walk in my new identity, Jesus. So Father, would you solidify, would you concrete the things that you started tonight? Lord, help us not get discouraged if we falter, if we fail. When we falter, when we fail, we fall into your grace and your mercy. But Lord, let us hold on to the living words that you spoke to us tonight. You're that personal, you're that good, and you have a plan for us. We thank you. We celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to be your children. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. God bless y'all. Thanks for coming tonight. You're dismissed.